it's time we got into our conversation tonight. Persons living with disability, both men and women, want to be productive members of the society, and they often strive to be so, but there are challenges that they still face day in, day out. Parts of what the government has done in past year to make sure that at least there is more accessibility and inclusion was the introduction of the Persons with Disability Act, as well as the creation of the National Council for Persons Living with Disability to at least help and enforce some of this. Joining me today is the Chairperson Honorable Peter Mushiri Mwangi, who indeed acknowledges that much has been done, but there is still a lot that can be done, sir. And I began by asking you, what, welcome and thank you for speaking to us today. Um, I began by asking you, even before we came on air, of concerns that you do have on some of the daily obstacles that you face moving around. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me say this, uh, Vincent. Uh, the National Council for Persons with Disability was, uh, was enacted by an Act of Parliament 2003, uh, Paper 14. And the National Council for Persons with Disability, the core mandate of the National Council is to make sure that persons advocate for the rights of persons with disability. Number two, to make sure that persons with disability, their rights are not infringed. Another thing is to make sure that persons with disability are registered with the government. And number two, another thing, uh, accessibility is taken care of right. of persons with disability. Right. Also, the census. As the National Council for Persons with Disability, we are delighted that we sit in the top seat of the steering committee of, of Kenya Bureau of Statistics, just to make sure that persons with disability are counted and the right figures and statistics are taken by the government. Right. And we'll be getting on the importance of such statistics because sure. this time around the government is going all out to make sure that that data is gotten and verified to the latter. I have concerns because even as we are in 2019 right now, years later after both um, the Persons with Disability Act came into play as well as the establishment of um, the council, we're still having cases of concealment of persons with disability. How then do we go around this? Okay, sure. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. One of these cases is about some people decide, you know, even in our cultures, when you get a child with disability, you give birth to a child with disability, what normally happens, some community believe this is a curse. Others believe that they don't want to take this child out. They hide this child inside their houses. Another thing is about the stigma, the stigma which persons with disability pass, even the parents of children with disability. Because when you give birth in a community and people start to look at you in another angle, and this is why some people decide even not to make, to make sure that children with disability, when you give birth, and even, even in some community, when they used to give birth, they used to kill those children. Right. Yeah. Has that improved over time? I, I'd wish to believe, but there's still much that can be done. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that uh, much can be done and much has been done. Right. Let me tell you one. When the government of Kenya empowered National Council for Persons with Disability, that was one of our main mandates, to make sure that all children with disability we make sure that they go to school. Another thing, we make sure that they are being done, the doctors check on their uh, health and they give them a medical report to the government and to the National Council so that these children, the government can know the number of children who has disability in a certain area. Right. And even so, sir, um, the government has indeed empowered the council, but you still mention issues of underst being understaffed uh, to an extent that you cannot get to implement some of this because um, part eight of the act in itself has offenses and penalties even to parents and guardians and next of kids who conceal persons living with disability and in such a manner as to deny such a person the opportunity and services available yeah. under the act. Um, we're looking at this still being rampant, but we're seeing very limited cases of people being put to book for perpetrating such. Yeah, uh, one of these things is about 
you know, we are human beings. And uh, all of us, we are created in different ways. Uh, one of these things, what the National Council does, is to make sure that some of these cases are brought to book. And in the National Council for Persons with Disability, we have a department of legal, whereby we take some of these cases, working in hand with some commission, like uh, Commission of Justice, take some of these cases to court, because human rights are human rights. It doesn't matter that you're a person with disability or you're not, but human rights are human rights. So what we do, we do as a National Council for Persons with Disability, as I have been telling, uh, I was telling you before we came on air, we understand because the whole of the National Council for Persons with Disability, we have 117 workers. When you take, take 47 workers from, uh, because we have one disability services officer in each and every county. Right. And you remember that a county is a very vast, some of these counties are very vast, for only one person to represent persons with disability. Right, so that leaves you with roughly uh, 70. 70. Right. And these 70s, 70 uh, workers in the National Council for Persons with Disability, remember we have even field workers who are there. Right. So we understand some of these things we cannot do because we don't have uh, manpower, the human resource which we require. Right now we have requested the National Treasury just to allow us to employ 47, another 47 workers so that they can give support to the 47 which we have already. Right, and will that reflect now on the delivery of the council? Because um, still the situation is, is, is that uh, they look at public transport, uh, public buildings themselves, most are not compliant by this. And part of what the council is mandated to do is at least provide specifications on access modifications that both public transport systems and public buildings are supposed to adhere to. Thank you so much. As a council, I, we know our mandate, one of the, our core mandate is about accessibility. Right. And how the government works is about government works in uh, partnership with government, other government agencies. This is why we are partnering with other government agencies to enforce the disability law right. of ass assessment, uh, assessment. The disability, uh, the assessment law makes sure that all buildings which are constructed must have a lift or a ram just to make sure that anybody can access that building. And let me ask you, Vincent, today, if you build this building, you don't put ram, you don't put stairs or a lift, even you as an able body, you cannot climb to the first floor. You cannot go to the first floor. That is what I'm saying. So disability are barriers created by other human beings just to hinder other human beings doing their own their own day to day business. So for us we shall enforce this. Look at the public transport. We have partnered with UN Habitant and National Gender and Equality Commission just to make sure that because the UN Habitant have agreed just to support all urban towns. And they have started with Nairobi. They are starting with Nairobi mm -hmm. as a pilot project right. just to make that transport, public transport for persons with disability, buildings, roads, name it. Right. And I saw you tweeted a picture of a very sad state of um, somebody using crutches but actually walking on a motorway, which I want to believe is pretty much dangerous for any pedestrian out there who's using that particular road. Pretty unfortunate there. Um, let's, look at, let's take a look at uh, going concerns. For example, right now they still, uh, there's a lot of debate on academia. Uh, we are transitioning to a new curriculum, but schools, uh, special schools are really not being given an ear on this. I've not seen much engagement with special schools yet. And there's a story in that regard where a principal of new special school for learners with mental disability, Esther Karanja, has lamented that as education stakeholders continue with the, the conversation on how to improve standards of education in the country, with many supporting adoption of the competence-based curriculum, too little focus has been directed to schools which offer learners to, which offer skills to learners with disabilities. I beg your pardon. Let's take a look at this story. We are coming back to engage much more with my guest, Honorable Peter Mushiri, Chairperson, NCPLWD. 
according to school principal Esther Karanja, disabled students in special schools are still suffering grave challenges ranging from lack of infrastructure to lack of facilities and equipment to enable studies. A good example of such schools is no special school for learners with mental disabilities. It has been offering a variety of courses to learners with different mental disorders including brain damage and autism spectrum disorder. Madam Karanja also points out that vocational training is the highest level of learning in the school whereby learners are equipped with life survival skills ranging from beadwork and jewelry making, carpentry and masonry, tailoring and embroidery, among other courses. And due to the challenges that we don't have machines for knitting, we use uh, the manual uh, crochets whereby uh, I train them how to make the pullovers, but it is not perfect. For to make something perfect like this one, you need the knitting machines. So, so I train them on meeting. Just like any other institution of its caliber in the country, the school is faced with several challenges such as inadequate supply of water, a strained mode of transport as most students have to walk to school and a ready market for their trainees. Despite having to overcome all these challenges, the school still boasts of great achievements. Most learners who went through the facility have been able to secure different jobs some venturing into entrepreneurship and others being absorbed into the school to offer their services in their areas of competence. Reporting for KUTV, Michael Redding. Well, a report by Michael Redding right there bring us to at least the concern of ongoing debates and conversations in the country. We have the competency-based curriculum. Now there is a transition that the government is fostering from the 844 to the 2633 system. Where do the persons with disability fall in all this? Okay. Uh, let me tell you, Vincent, today we had a launch, a national launch for CBC. Right. And the guest of honor was His Excellency the President. And for us as persons with disability, we are still holding talks with the Ministry of Education so that to make sure that children with disability are taken care of. Even the current system of uh, education which we have did not cater for persons with disability, let me tell you. Because, and that is why, two years back, the president said that the exam which is set for students who are, happen to be doing the class eight and form four, right. that persons with disability will be doing their own exam. And this is, this is a very good move, let me tell you. Because look at the speed of persons with disability. Some of these students, some of these students are visually impaired. We are talking about the material, the brails. Some schools have no capacity to provide this braille. One braille, let me tell you, it's about 80,000. And that is why the president said, if the exam are being set, persons with disability, their exam will be set totally different with the able bodies. Right. And that was a plus for this government. In the right direction. Yeah. So the CBC, you've mentioned that uh, the council and even persons living with disability are still in consultation with the government on yeah. how it is going to be made to suit at Taylor least. Tailor-made. Right. Yeah. Um, great to have that uh, determination. And now let, let's talk about um, other going concerns. For example, the Building Bridges Initiative, for example. We are at a place where we are having a lot of conversations on politics and so on and so forth. But we've not seen um, interests of... Uh, I'd, I'd say minority groups, in this case, persons with disability, even being under that. Uh, we, we've not seen any representation on the task force, for example. Are you concerned about this? And who gives you the voice now um, if you are not particularly represented yourself? Uh, we presented our views as persons with disability through our leaders who represent us in the National Assembly and the Senate. And for us as persons with disability, we have been advocating that we need an electoral college for persons with disability. We are talking about the top leadership. That is what the BBI is talking about. And as persons with disability, we support this BBI. Why? Because the top leadership, we are saying about the major, major tribes. One of the major tribes is persons with disability. And I'm telling you, Vincent, you will come to prove me wrong when this censor 
happen. Persons with disability, we are about 6 million. Right, and those... That is the biggest the constituency. Right. Even more than a county. We are talking even more, like, more than a county. And that is why, as persons with disability, we are determined that we need to be electing our own leaders as persons with disability. When you look at the political arena in our country, and you are telling somebody uh, like persons with disability, some of them have mobility challenges, some of them are visual, some of them are deaf, just to compete with able bodies, and you see what happen, usually happen. Chairs are thrown left and right. Yeah? People, even people will organize even how you can be, how people can uh, um, um, uh, malign your, 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 your reputation and also hurt you. So for us as persons with disabilities, what we are saying, we need to a fully inclusion of persons with disability. We are the biggest tribe in this country. We are the biggest constituent in this country. And we shall not take short of that. Right. And you've noted that approximations right now put the number of persons living with disability in Kenya around between five and six million, according to at least approximations uh, by bodies concerned and that have been doing their own research on this. That data is yet to be uh, verified, at least. Yes. But in the oncoming census, we're looking forward to having a sincere count yeah. and an accurate count on the same. What is um, what do you expect to be deduced from this data? What do you expect to be the consequent consequence of having such data for the first time in a while? Yes, and that is why we have started as the National Council for Persons with Disability. We have started a nationwide campaign just to make sure and urging our people to come out in large numbers so that they can be counted to make sure that the government gets the right statistic in order of planning. What the government has been giving us, they have been giving us on a statistic of 1.3 million persons with disability. And we believe we are about 6 million. But that I'm talking about the statistic of 2009. Right. 10 years down the line, we are talking about 10 years down the line. A lot has happened. Look at the accident day and night. We are only being told those people who died. What about those people who are maimed? What about terrorism, sickness? I believe that persons with disability, the statistic, when the statistic come out, persons with disability will be about 7 million or 6.5 million. I have no doubt. And, 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 and sir, now, um, as your closing remark, I, I want a general call out from you uh, because we've seen there are a lot of persons who live with disability in, in the country as it is right now, but not most of them have money to um, at least accrue the level of, of success I'd like, to, um, I'd, I'd like to say that you have. What perhaps might have cut you out? One, uh, as a person with disability, you must believe in yourself. Accept your situation and move forward. Be very aggressive on what you're doing and very consistent. I'm saying this because us as persons with disability, government has given us a lot of opportunities. Look at the 30% opportunities. Last Friday, I had a meeting with the head of procurement in the National Treasury, and he was telling me only one, uh, 575 company farms for persons with disability against 80,000 farms of women. 56,000 for youth. What are we saying as persons with disability? We are supposed to come out and make sure that we grab these opportunities. What we need, we don't need favors. We just need opportunities for persons with disability. We are more capable, even more than able bodies. That is why we are urging our people, as the National Council for Persons with Disability, right now we are holding talks with the government, how we can secure these businesses for our people. Because 30% mean 10% for persons with disability, 10% for youth, and 10% for women. But now, persons with disability, we are just getting around 1%. So for us, we are urging our people, the National Council for Persons with Disability will change. And will change massively. So that persons with disability can benefit from what their government is giving them. Thank you very much for speaking with KUTV News today, sir.
I'm Peter Mushiri Mwangi, Chairperson National Council for Persons with Disability in Kenya right now. We take a short breather. The broadcast comes back with more, but continue engaging with us on our social media at KUTV Kenya at V underscore I'll be getting to sample much more of that as the broadcast continues. <laughs>